The scripture today is taken from Matthew, and it's the 17th chapter of Matthew, the very first nine verses where we find these words. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here and if you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Word of God, written by the people of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As part of our time together today, I've been asked to read a thematic focus that helps us to enter into the Scripture, perhaps today. Interestingly, the Greek word that has traditionally been translated as transfigured is metamorphu, from which we derive the English word, for instance, metamorphosis or metamorphosis. When the word is used in the New Testament, and, and four different times it's used, it describes not the changing of an identity as though something completely new comes about. Instead, it's used to heighten the revelation of a glory that is already there, an illumination of a thing already present, but perhaps hidden or unrecognized. When Jesus is transfigured, in other words, it is not a moment in which he suddenly becomes glorious. No. Rather, it's a moment in which his already actualized glory finds a grand expression in a manner that ushers his disciples into a revelation of the historical and cosmetic, cosmic significance of the lordship of the one they are following. Do such transfigured moments still occur? In other words, in my words, is a historic action still possible from a historical example? Are there still occasions when God takes hold of ordinary circumstances and, and transfigures them so that the presence and glory of God, perhaps momentarily hidden beneath the blanket of perhaps, let's just say, pain and grief, are now suddenly fresh? renewed, and a revelation. Perhaps Lent is an opportunity to pay attention to the transfigured moments that God is presently initiating in our journeys. Moments when the reality and the glory of Jesus become vibrantly clear through circumstances and situations that suddenly become mounds of revelation. There are a number of questions to consider or to think about this day in relationship to transfiguration. Not just then, but now and the days to come. For instance, take a moment and reflect upon the experience of Jesus' transfiguration. 
and what about it speaks to our own heart, what it says to our own heart. What does it reveal? Why is it still significant today? Take another moment and see how you might respond to this. Have you experienced personal moments of transfiguration in your own journey? Moments that while perhaps not as dramatic as what the disciples experienced, and yet that made the reality or the present glorious and perhaps helped Jesus to be dramatically clearer to you and to those present. And also how might our experiences on the mountaintops impact the way we walk in the valleys. And we all know our world today is filled with a lot of those valleys. But as disciples of Christ, as witnesses of the historical, if you will, impact of a transfiguration, can we be historic, if you will, in our application and our ability for that event to continue to have power in today's world? And lastly, how are you experiencing the glory of Jesus Christ these days? How was that experience of his glory impacting the way you see the world? The way you see the church? The way you see your own community in which you happen to live? Or the way you see your congregation, the family of faith, that you may be a lay leader or have a pastoral responsibility for? How do you see it today? It is our hope that this scripture and this Lenten season and these particular sessions that we are providing will nurture your walk of faith and as a leader in this Methodist movement will guide the things that you, you do, the things that you experience, the things that you have responsibility for and the surprises that come up each and every week in ministry today. I ask if we might pause in these moments and let us close with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks to your ongoing gifts of uh, spiritual disciplines and direction. And in particular today, we give thanks for transfiguration and the opportunities, not just to recall what happened to the disciples back then, but what continues to happen each and every day in our journeys of faith upon the mountains and in the valleys. Lord, we thank you for the blessings and the spiritual presence that you give to us and to assist us in expressing that presence and that power of the Spirit each and every day. Hear our prayer of gratitude, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we thank you for those moments in this Methodist movement that we recall heartwarming experiences that provide new direction or renewed emphasis upon our faith-filled journeys. We give you thanks, Lord, for those moments in our own lives, as different as they might be or as regular as they might become or how only they've happened once or twice, yet hear our prayer of appreciation for the personal relationships we're able to have with you and your living spirit through Christ, we pray. And in our time and in the wilderness that we are experiencing in the world, whether because of the health concerns related to COVID 
or whether it's because of the isolation that we are responding to those uh, diseases and concerns with, or whether it's because of the lack of being able to be normal with family and friends and with loved ones. Lord, hear our prayer of thanks first for the fortitude and for the, the courage and for the support that we continue to seek to provide for one another, even in these difficult times. But also hear our prayers for those that are not able to find such support and such kindness and compassion and who are alone. So in our prayer, Lord, let us listen to you so that we might be guided and directed in those areas and those directions for those individuals and the people of your world, that world that you came to save, so that we might assist in the power of your ministry and presence with the things that we say, the things that we can do, the ways that we can offer faith. Help us, Lord, in these moments to hear your prayers. And so, gracious God, as we recall the scripture of transfiguration, may we also recall the possibilities on how that scripture can be alive in our own lives and how we might guide others who are unfamiliar with the historical transfiguration and yet could be touched and made personally familiar with the historic power of God's presence and the gift of transfiguration. So until we meet again, Lord, we often pray and ask that you would be with us, and so we do but also help each and every one of us to be with you until we meet again. Guide us and let us go in peace. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the 11th chapter of Mark verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at the doorway and they un as they untied it. Some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Most of you know that to me, Names are, are important. Names identify who we are and whose we are. For instance, my last name is Morrison. It is Scottish in origin. As a Scotsman, literally it translates as son of Morris. Across time, it got rendered to simply Morrison. Such is the origin of Scott names and in son. In extended family circles or in my hometown, when I run into someone my age or older, often I will introduce myself as Ed and Carolyn's youngest son, Alan. And for those who knew my parents, it makes an immediate connection. Even arriving here at our two churches, there 
were some of you who were immediately able to connect to me because of knowing either my father or one of my older brothers. Some of you grew up in families where you were raised to understand that you represented the family name whenever you left the house. How you behaved in public mattered because it reflected on the whole family. And certainly for me as the youngest of five boys, I know that was true. In high school, I had teachers that had taught my mom's youngest brother and sister, my four older brothers and me, and before they retired, they ended up teaching several of my nephews and nieces along the way. I'm sure the Morrison clan added a few gray hairs to their head and the loss of hair for some others. The family name made a difference. It set expectations. Fortunately, my older relatives didn't set the bar too high academically but it doesn't surprise people that know my family to find out my involvement with church or with scouting. Names identify who we are and whose we are. In Mark 11th chapter, verse nine, we hear proclaimed, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a quote from Psalm 118, verse 26. The, the people were celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry using the words of the Psalms to proclaim their king. Now, older English translations, such as the Revised Standard Version and the New International Version, translate the Hebrew to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the Hebrew language is not gendered. And in English, we have no pronoun for God, only he and she. So some modern English translations render the sentence as, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now we may ask, well, since Jesus was male, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the psalm does not intend to be just about Jesus, but to be about all. Who come in the name of the Lord. Remember what I said, naming is important. It speaks of who and whose we are as followers of Jesus Christ. We represent the name of the Lord as well. And so this proclamation is not just for Jesus. It is for us as well. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As Christians, we are members of the Lord's family and we are blessed so that we may be a blessing to others. And when we go out into the world, we represent God. We come in the name of the Lord. And so blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And as you go forth into the world, be blessed. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come this day proclaiming your name, raising you up as our king, remembering that we too are called to come in the name of the Lord, as did you. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be worthy, that what we do and what we say may be pleasing in your sight, that we may embrace the world with your love. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
this Sunday is both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. On this day, we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but we also remember the pain of those last days. Monday, Thursday recalls the Last Supper, and this Thursday, as we gather together, we too will remember the Last Supper in some powerful ways. Good Friday recalls the death of Christ. They set the stage for celebration of Easter resurrection. But the journey for Jesus was not simply from the triumphal entry to Jerusalem to the resurrection. Suffering and death came in between. In observance of Passion Sunday, we recall the suffering and death that was God's gift for us. We will intersperse singing the hymns with the hearing of Scripture. So I invite you now to hear the passion of Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of Mark, as recorded in the 14th and 15th chapters. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. And while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room and where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, 
tonight. Before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be dis deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Let us lift our voices in singing, go to dark Gethsemane.
Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priests. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. And after a little while, while standing near, said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plan. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, replied Jesus. The chief priests accused him of many things, so again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. 
A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was born in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid.
day begins Holy Week. It is the most intense week in the Christian year. It confronts us with the violence that we inflict upon each other and our faithlessness toward God. Juxtaposed dramatically against the love of God and the hope that God's kingdom offers our world. Whether we gather in our sanctuaries or we gather online, we are the church. Receive now this blessing. We too, O Lord, began singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, but as we see the violence of the world unfold, the question remains, will we be caught up in that violence or will we remain steadfast in the hope that Christ offers the world and offers us that indeed we may be blessed and go forth in the name of the Lord. Go now in the peace of Christ this day and every day. Amen.